What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Sports Case Hockey Playoff Edition. It's the most wonderful time of the year, aside from Christmas, obviously, where we are finally back in hockey playoffs. And more importantly, the Bolts are back in hockey playoffs. So where do we start? The fact that Toronto and Tampa Bay are meeting up for the first time historically, that's amazing. Um, there's so many milestones to that because, of course, previously before postseason you have steven sankos rack up such an accolade against the toronto maple leaves and it meant so much to him on many scales his family being in the building and him passing up marty st louis as well as doing it against a team that he grew up looking up to um we know that for a lot of Canadian players, if you weren't watching the Toronto Maple Leafs, you were watching uh, Montreal. So any kind of milestone that you can hit against those teams is going to be monumental. And now here we are in the postseason where you've got Steven Samkos and the rest of Bolts going up head to head versus the Toronto Maple Leafs. So round one, game one kicked off Monday night and it was climatic and anticlimactic all in one, if you will. If you're a Bolts fan, then it was extraordinarily underwhelming of a game due to the fact that no one expected a shutout of zero to five to the Maple Leafs. Now diving into that, kind of picking it apart a little bit more, you know, the guys came off of two rough games before heading in the postseason, and they were on the road and then went straight up to Toronto to begin their playoff run. Uh, their game against the New York, the New York, the New York Islanders on Friday wasn't a pretty execution. They just happened to do what they do best and create a comeback momentum. And that's what they did. They were down and then they ended up beating them six to four and not having to go into overtime, which is something we know that the Bolts somehow find a way to love to do or a position they always find themselves in. So I would say between the fatigue of that and just the fact that the fast, last time they faced off with Toronto it was an 8-1 victory minus Austin Mahomes being on the roster that evening. Um, I would kind of play it out to the fact that they headed into Monday night a little overly confident. Now, of course, you want to play with confidence. You need that confidence and that swagger to execute, especially as a team. But I think they kind of underestimated the, the pace and the pressure that Toronto was going to be able to apply, uh, not to any kind of detrimental extent, because of course Toronto isn't a franchise record breaking year themselves with the most wins, I think at 54 or 56. So there's a lot of things that play into underestimating and overestimating this Toronto Maple Leafs team. Uh, the first period wasn't as uh, tragic as um, you would think with it being a zero to five shutout. They had a few glimmers of hope where it looked like they were starting to get their feet about them. And then they miss major opportunities in the power play, especially when you hit a five minute major and you can't execute on that. That's going to take some wind from beneath your sails. And I think coach Cooper basically said the same thing after the game. If you can't maximize on those opportunities, it's going to be very defeating and it's hard to kind of overcome that rut and skate hard against it. So Opening up with that was definitely an issue. Um, most of you guys that follow my coverage for the Tampa Bay Lightning know that I am adamant on not relying on the power play to bring you momentous swings. While the power play is there for that reason, to give you an upper hand, to create and generate momentum and offensive opportunities, if you're sitting back on your heels and waiting for a power play to come to you in order to get the puck in the net, you can be putting yourself in a, in a very deficient position from the beginning of the game. So, before the last two road games closing out the regular season, the Lightning started really maximizing on those fast starts, coming out and generating offense immediately, creating turnovers in the neutral zone. You were seeing hockey executed very well. Um, everyone's been talking about how this team's been touch and go all season. But like most commentators at this point, I will highlight the fact that this has been a team that's had to overcome injuries to such an not to, to such an exhausting extent, if you will. Um, you know, opening up the season, you've got a guy like Alex Kalorn who came off of a, a, a broken leg during the playoffs during the finale versus Montreal or tried to bounce back during the Stanley Cup finale versus Montreal. And you never know how players are going to bounce back coming from such significant injuries. So you've got Killer coming in and, and easing his way back into probably one of his best career seasons, which has been amazing to watch. Then you have 
Kucherov and out in the beginning of the season. Then you have Braden Point missing significant time. And I don't want to say the middle of the season, but before the halfway point of the season. And then something that we hadn't really seen too much of besides a few games being missed last year by Victor Hedman um, was the defense really took a beating this year. You had lost Eric Chernak for a significant amount of games and he kept fighting to bounce back. Then Zach Bogosian was out for a significant amount of games, all while continuing to groom a guy like Cal Foot and throwing him into big games. There was a lot of calls from Syracuse, uh, rotating players in before those trade deadlines. So amongst all of the adversity, if you really look at what this team has accomplished, you know that they have the the grit, you know that they have the strength, the confidence and just the the teamwork to really execute in playoffs. So game one should be far from a label on what they sh- should and will accomplish in this playoff run. All that to say, um, the biggest issue that I've seen in the past couple of games or in their losses in the 20, you know, in this half of the season is that defense is playing a loose game in front of Vassie. Um, There was a lot of question marks around the fact that Vassie was pulled for the first time and God knows how long games ago. And, you know, after that, defense really realized what they need to do. And this team is really good at taking responsibility, not only for their individual roles, but how they affect each other as a team or as a line. Um, so that the, those defensive pairings, that defensive strength of playing, I didn't see that Monday night versus Toronto. Um they just seemed very kind of, you know, a lot of miscues, a lot of um, just kind of hustling back. They were getting beat on odd men rushes. So this is a team that's really good at correcting mistakes very quickly. Uh, they pivot on a dime. They know where where to step up. They have this pride and this chip on their shoulder to make sure that they do not go into a game making the same exact mistakes. That's one thing you can say about the Tampa Bay Lightning is that you will never catch them in back-to-back games making the same exact mistakes. If that's what ends up happening, you know that there's something deeply wrong, but for the most part, they're very well at making sure that they Mm. pivot and execute and clean up those mistakes from the previous game before. So I would expect to see a much tighter game defensively. Um, Coach Cooper does speak highly of the fact that he doesn't want defense to be overworked in the first couple of periods, or he doesn't want to overload their plate, but then just having a better communication back there and tighter play in the defensive zone will be a significant help. At this point, you kind of have a feel of what Toronto's pace is going to be. They have an ability to play pretty quickly. Uh, Marner, Matthews, as well as Case, they were on fire for the Maple Leaves on Monday night. There was an issue with William Nylander. Apparently he had food poisoning heading into that game, some bad sushi. I don't know who can even eat sushi before a game. I mean, I was so weird about what I would eat before a soccer game just because the last thing I wanted to do is feel that on my chest. So to be able to eat sushi and go skate, like eat sushi and do cardio, he was asking for a problem. It's That's pretty gritty. That's gross. Um, but anyhow, so apparently Nylander only had food poisoning and um, – and shouldn't affect his return into this evening's matchup. Something else to keep in play is that, you know, when when defense doesn't particularly show up to the full amount, and I can't speak for the entire defense because Cal Foot has made significant confident strides as a defensive player for the Tampa Bay Lightning. It's um it's very impressive. But, you know, you can expect that from that caliber of a kid because, you know, his father played in the NHL. He had that grooming and, you know, it takes a minute to kind of find your character, your niche, your your identity in a sport, especially when you're coming up behind a relative, i.e. a dad. So it's nice to see Cal Foot kind of finding his stride, finding his confidence. And he played very well Monday night, but that was kind of a solo defensive performance. Um, you know, when Foot's usually on the roster, Bogo is scratched. I was chatting earlier on the J.P. Peterson show, just kind of alluding to the fact that I think I like Zach Bogosian in playoffs. Um, I like his physicality. I like his hustle. I like the fact that he can be an offensive contributor, at least push the puck forward like some significant defenseman can do well. Um, That he's just he's very temperamental. And I think in the last couple of games that he was in over Cal foot, he was racking up more, you know, penalty mm-hmm. box minutes than helping push the puck forward and, and create those offensive opportunities for his team. So that's kind of my, eh, on why, um, you know, Bogo's probably taking the back seat on, on the roster at the moment. And then you have Jan Ruda back in who we know that in a great passing scheme, 
Jan Ruda can actually open up, rip the puck, and and find the back of the net. Something that really helped this team in both of their playoff runs and back-to-back Stanley Cup championships was having those defensive players that can really step up, rip a shot from the blue line, and contribute offensively. And, you know, Jan Ruda has scored goals in the Stanley Cup final. Victor Hedman, of course, no shocker there. Eric Chernak has stepped up uh, so much as no longer being a stay-at-home defenseman. I think he left that identity back in 2019 and has made big strides year by year. Um, but, you know, just as of late, he had an assist. He's had multiple assists on on major goals that the Tampa Bay Lightning have needed. So I think the better game that the defensive players play, they allow the, the their forwards, their wingers to really open up step into their structure confidently. And I say mindlessly as to the fact that they don't have to overanalyze or hesitate. They can really just get that puck movement going and, you know, take those shots or maximize on, on one top one timer opportunities. Um, So I would really just look for the defense to come together so much more this evening, hold down that blue line, minimize on man rushes, really take pace and control of the game versus Toronto tonight. And if there's a team that can do it, it's the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, I'm trying to think of anything other significant. The press slash media, the Tampa Bay Lightning media are meeting with Coach Cooper and Corey Perry right now, uh, post an optional morning skate. Um, You know, I know that Bazzi and a few of the guys really just kind of needed to rest their body. Other guys probably just want to kind of get their legs about them, but they had a great practice yesterday. Um, You can see that information over at TampaBayLightning.com, whereas the guys just felt like yesterday's practice was a great reset. Uh, pierre Edouard Belmar said that he feels like they made the, the changes that they needed to make in yesterday's practice to gear up for game two today. Mm-hmm. So one thing, one other thing amongst all the things that this team is also really good at is turning that page quick, um, not lingering in the conversation. They won't even linger on, on responses to the media. It's when that game's over, that game is over and behind them. They know the adjustments that they have to make. Every player feels really good about the adjustments already being made in practice yesterday. And, you know, there was some reports that came out about Kucherov and just sitting on the ice, like ripping shot after shot after shot, just kind of finding his stroke again. And sometimes that's a thing you need to do because I know part of this conversation has been me saying that the defense needs to step up and, you know, play a tighter game and, and, you know, really beat those odd man rushes. But the other part of it is that there were passes and, past sequences that started to come together that looked so promising and then it'd be like a whiff on the puck so a lot of a lot of the the scoring attempts were just kind of like you can't say bad passes but just bad setups to shoot or you know inopportune situations between the stick and the puck i don't know stammer had if if logistics would have matched what you're seeing generating on the ice Um, you would have thought that the Bolts could have at least claimed three goals. Uh, Stammer, you know, took the knee down to try to rip two shots from his favorite spot, and it just wouldn't go. Um, At some points, the puck was just a little too far ahead of him, and and his stick got a bad touch of it. Um, Kucherov just kind of really couldn't find his, his, his stroke in that game. So I think multiple factors just played into an interesting sloppy first game so for the guys to have an opportunity to practice and there's something that's always stuck with me last year during playoffs uh after i think it was in round two a press conference with coach cooper he was just saying like but of course last season the prior season the bubble were very different uh especially different circumstances but i remember coach cooper saying you don't realize that once you're in season you're not really practicing you're not getting those days or those opportunities to really practice. And when you're trying to build chemistry, when you're, when you're shuffling the lines, when you've got, you know, new guys coming in from trade deadlines and so on and so forth, their practice is in those games. And so I know that coach Cooper was saying it, you see a whole different team when they just get a minute to practice, when they get a minute to be a team and to, to be, you know, in the building and just kind of, hone their craft and and focus on on their structure, their semantics, their way of playing, you see a different team come out in a game. And so that's something that I'm excited to see what translates from yesterday's practice into tonight's matchup versus the Maple Leafs is that not only did they get an opportunity to practice because now we're kind of back to some sense of normality in the schedule and um, when the guys play in between and so on and so forth, but you're also 
seeing a team that feels like they had a great practice that feels like they executed really well on the things that they needed to clean up and work on, um, getting an opportunity to just really sit there and work on their shooting. You know, you have to feel out your shots on, on different ice and different arenas and, you know, find what that rhythm is going to feel like heading into a game. So to be able to have that moment um, and to know what Coach Cooper thinks of practice and how significant he feels like it, it plays into their games following after great practices, I am excited to see what the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, produce this evening. Of course, some other funny things that we can expect to see tonight is that Toronto's probably going to come in high and confident on what they did Monday night. And, you know, rightfully so, as they should. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of interesting round one game one games that went down, uh, high scoring, shutouts, overtimes. I mean, it's playoffs. But a good thing about Toronto maybe going into tonight's game uh, high and confident is the fact that they're probably going to bring an extra element to their physical game. And Coach Cooper just said something to the media that I absolutely loved. He was saying, he was speaking on Pat Maroon. He was saying how Maroon is, they haven't had a guy like Maroon. And there's so many elements to that because Maroon's not only, you know, he's not the fastest skater, no, but he skates hard when he does. Um, he's a big body on the ice to body up certain guys, which is great. And he is not afraid to take a shot and create a scoring opportunity. I mean, he's done really well with loading up the goals this season. And so another element to Pat Maroon is his protective instinct on the ice, uh, his, his, his sportsmanship for protecting his team, not sportsmanlike conduct, but sportsmanship for protecting his team. And coach Cooper said, you know, they haven't had a guy on their roster that would square up or look a guy like Chara in the eye. Now, mind you, we all know who Chara is. He's, we think Victor Hedman's big on skates and then you have Chara who's like seven, five on skates. So you've got this fearlessness in a guy like Pat Maroon. And, you know, I played, I didn't play hockey. I played soccer, but I know that heading onto the field, heading into a game and having somebody who has this fearless demeanor to them, it's going to, it's going to resonate with you. It's going to, it's going to spread to you. It's, it's very contagious. So, to know that you've got a guy like that on your team, to head into physical matchups with a guy like that on your team, it's it's exciting because you know somebody has your back. You know every guy on that team has each other's back, but Pat Maroon just kind of brings a whole different presence to it, and it was interesting that Coach Cooper spoke on that. Um, another kind of funny twist is that Corey Perry was asked about the pileup that took place towards the end of game one on Monday night, and <laughs> he straight up just responded to the media, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that just kind of plays into the fact that this team is a page turner. Once it's done, it is done. Um, with that being said, some updates on the pile that took place Monday night is Pat Maroon caught a fine, um, Corey Perry caught a fine, and uh, Simmons caught a fine. Clifford is suspended, so he will not be in tonight's game after boarding, um, having a boarding call on Ross Colton, which, I mean, obviously, if you watch the play, it speaks for itself. It, you know, the play was over. Ross was against the boards, and he just kind of came up and laid, a, laid, laid one on him, which was very unnecessary. Not to stir the pot, but speaking of unnecessary, something that was kind of lost on me. <laughs> was that mm -hmm. final pileup of the game uh, when things kind of cooled off for a second, not for Corey Perry, because something really did get him worked up. Um, he, you know, he had the guy in the headlock. That's, that's all you really need to see and know to know that somebody really got pissed off in that moment. But while things were kind of diffusing outside of the Corey Perry situation, you've got Simmons who comes up behind Victor Hedman, who's standing there minding his own business and puts his glove to his neck to start basically like choking him. So he pinpointed him for a fight, which of course is going to throw Victor Hedman off. And let's be serious guys in life, as well as on the ice court pitch, whatever you want to call it. If somebody touches your neck, that's kind of a seeing red situation. So for Simmons to just collect a fine on that rather than a suspension or anything more significant, I am pretty mind blown. Um, Again, if you go back and watch the fight, Victor is just standing there. It's not even like Victor had him, like had another one of the Maple Leaves locked up or he was in the middle of a tussle with someone else. I mean, dude is standing there and then Simmons just kind of comes up behind him, snatches on the neck, and then there goes that whole other, you know, turns into the pile up and, and everybody kind of just 
breaks out into their own little fighting circles. So that one kind of surprised me. Clifford was a clear one. Yes, he had no business touching Ross Colton, but then Simmons had no business touching Victor Hedman. It's not a biased statement. It's just clear as day if you go back and watch the video. And I was surprised that he walked away with a $2,250 fine. Uh, yeah. So we're definitely in for more physicality, uh, tension, and maybe some old scores to be settled for Monday night, even though these both – no, I can't speak for both teams. Even though Tampa Lightning is a page turner, you do kind of see that lingering tension from some some previous fights. So to have Pat Maroon back on the ice tonight, to have Simmons back on the ice tonight, to know what went down Monday night, to see that Maroon was taunting Simmons to try to get in another fight with them, and the last time these teams met mm -hmm. before playoffs in that 8-1 victory for Tampa Bay, Maroon and Simmons went at it again, and it was intense. So – we're definitely looking towards some intensity this evening. Let's just hope that physicality doesn't win out and this turns into, you know, a stop and go of fights. The Lightning just really need to come out and focus on their game, focus on conducting their pace, controlling the game, getting those turnovers and interrupting the passing lanes in the neutral zone and optimizing in the offensive zone. So I am soaked. Round two, I mean, round one, game two. Tonight, still in Toronto, the buzz of Toronto having fans and being back in the building, all that hype, that's behind us now. Now it's just time to focus on playoffs, good hockey, clean hockey, aside from the tension that will definitely be a brewing, and hopefully a Bucks victim. Bucks. Look at my brains out today. That's how, you should, that's how you see how many things I'm running around and doing. A Bolts victory, mm -hmm. if you will. Pardon me, guys. Um, and just level off the series before Tampa Bay returns home to host them for two. And on Friday night and Sunday night. So let me know you guys' thoughts and predictions for round one, game two, Tampa Bay versus Toronto. Can Tampa Bay level the series or will Toronto maximize off of that confident display Monday night and bring it back into game two? Let me know all your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for joining me at the Sports Case where I'll be bringing you pregame videos as well as post-game recaps throughout the entire playoff series. You guys have a great one. Enjoy this playoffs. And if you are in Tampa Bay, make sure you head downtown to all of the places where you can enjoy watching the game. Watch party back at Sparkman. Then you have Hat Tricks, American Social, uh, Park and Rec, and Splitsville in Sparkman. So, so many places to just hang out with your friends and be the distant thunder. Have a great one, guys.